Early in the afternoon on May 3rd, 1945, a Yugoslavian prisoner named Zvonimir Kukovic left the gates of Austria's Itter Castle, a looming fortress on a hill where he was being held by Nazi SS guards, and bicycled into the thick forests beyond. He was supposed to be running an errand for the prison's commander, Sebastian Wimmer, a not infrequent occurrence, as Kukovic had earned the Nazi commander's trust as a maintenance man and electrician who had helped convert the castle into a German prison. But Kukovic had an ulterior motive that afternoon. He was carrying a contraband note written by English-speaking prisoners inside. He had agreed to take the note out of prison and present it to the first group of American soldiers he encountered. And so, instead of running the errand and returning to the castle, as he usually did, he continued riding. Kukovic considered making the short ride west to Virgil, a small city close to the German-Austrian border. But the town was still densely occupied by German troops, and so instead he made the much longer trip to Innsbruck, riding over 40 miles along the Inn River Valley. He reached the city that evening, where he succeeded in tracking down a group of Americans, the 409th Infantry Regiment of the American 103rd Infantry Division, and passed on his note. The unit did not have the authorization to move forward with a rescue attempt themselves, but they promised Kukovic a definitive answer from their headquarters by the next morning. What followed is one of the more extraordinary and unlikely stories of World War II. The story of an American army commander working together with his enemy, an SS captain and a Wehrmacht major, to lead a mixed company of American and German troops to an Austrian castle and rescue a group of French political prisoners. What is now known was the battle for Castle Itter. The Castle Itter Castle sits atop a hill overlooking the village of Itter to the east in the Austrian state of Tyrol. The castle sits at the entrance to Austria's picturesque Brixen Valley, a site where some manner of fortress had existed since the 11th century. The modern iteration of the castle was built in 1878 atop the foundation of its predecessor. In 1925, the castle was purchased by the wealthy aristocrat Dr. Franz Grüne, the deputy governor of the surrounding state of Tyrol. He used the spacious estate primarily as a place to house his sizable collection of artwork and sculptures. After the Anschluss in March of 1938, in which Austria was forcibly annexed by Nazi Germany, the country was divided into seven districts, with Itter and the rest of Tyrol governed by a provincial Nazi government stationed in Vorarlberg, 90 miles to the southwest. Itter Castle or Schloss Itter, as it was called in German, was officially leased from Dr. Grüner by the Nazis. At first, the castle was mostly left alone during the first months of German occupation. The SS and the Wehrmacht, Germany's massive unified army, were more focused on stamping out any semblance of Austrian independence elsewhere and devouring the country as a whole into their empire. German Aggression the German war effort depended on the rapid expansion of their armed forces by assimilating young men from every country they conquered. Within days of the Anschluss, the entire Austrian army was consolidated into the Wehrmacht. Some Austrian soldiers served the Nazi cause willingly, even enthusiastically, but many others accepted their orders only as a last resort to avoid the punishment of death. Small Austrian resistance groups persisted throughout the occupation, both in larger cities like Vienna and in towns like Virgil. Though German recruitment efforts attempted to weed out any Austrian soldiers considered to be political liabilities, many young men who privately despised the Nazis ended up in their ranks, where they learned of the military strategies being employed by Wehrmacht commanders up close. In a parallel effort, a branch of the Nazis Waffen-SS, the party's branded police force, had been operating in secret in Austria since 1934. Their primary objective was to identify and flag any Austrians who were anticipated to resist occupation or otherwise present a threat. This effort paved the way for the oncoming Anschluss. Dissidents, nationalists, leftists, and others were rounded up, leading Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS and one of Hitler's most trusted advisors, to the realization that the Wehrmacht would require secure sites in Austria to temporarily house these political prisoners until they could be transported to German prisons and concentration camps. Itter Castle's strategic position, along with its thick walls, dry moat, and large gatehouse, made it an ideal venue for a prison. After a brief period in which the castle was being used as a headquarters for Hitler's anti-tobacco campaign, the German alliance for combating the dangers of tobacco, Himmler set his sights on the castle and requested that it be acquired permanently for, quote, special SS use. Building a Prison On February 7th, 1943, SS Lieutenant General Oswald Pohl 
under direct orders from Himmler, suddenly terminated the lease agreement with the castle's owner, Dr. Gruner, and seized the property outright with the intent of quickly converting it into a large Nazi holding cell. The project was spearheaded by Albert Speer, Hitler's Minister of Armaments and War Production, who designated SS Second Lieutenant Petz to remain on site and oversee construction. Petz arrived at the castle on February 8, 1943, with 27 prisoners, both from Dachau and the Flossenburg camps, to act as his labor force. Over the following months, the castle was gutted and transformed into a prison camp, its guest rooms converted into cells and offices for SS brass, its various entrances and exits thoroughly escape-proofed. The project was completed on April 25, 1943, and Petz departed, taking most of his prisoner workforce with him back to Dachau. Only two guards and an electrical worker, Zvonimir Kukovic, were left behind to finish odds and ends of the job. Kukovic was a 36-year-old Croatian who had made his living as an electrical technician before the German invasion of Yugoslavia in April 1941. After the attack, he joined a Yugoslav anti-Nazi resistance group, the National Liberation Army, but was arrested by the Gestapo in December 1941. He spent time in several Nazi prison camps before ending up in Dachau in September of 1942. His proficiency as an electrician saved him from being executed, and he was added to the camp's maintenance crew, under Petz's supervision, which is how he eventually wound up at Itter Castle the following year. The newly opened Itter prison's operations were placed under the authority of the Dachau concentration camp in southwest Germany, 90 miles northwest from Itter. Fifteen members of Dachau's SS unit were relocated to the castle to form the prison's guard force. Command of the castle was awarded to SS Captain Sebastian Wimmer, a native Bavarian who had made a name for himself overseeing the Majdanek concentration camp in Poland. Wimmer was notoriously sadistic and unpredictable, and prone to flying into drunken rages. Many who knew him labeled him a sociopath, but he was useful in streamlining his cruelty to get results. Wimmer, upon arrival, attempted to whip the newly formed guard force into shape. He implemented surprise inspections and escape drills to prepare, all of which Kokovic observed with interest from his cell, recording notes in a contraband notebook he had stolen from the SS guard room. On May 2, 1943, Kokovic watched from his cell as two Mercedes cars with SS flags attached arrived outside the castle gates, and three men exited the first car. Kokovic was shocked to realize he recognized all three, Edouard Deladier, General Maurice Gamelon, and Leon Jouot three of the most prominent members of the French Resistance, who would become the first of several VIP prisoners to be rounded up and held hostage at Itter Castle. The Prisoners Alongside Austrian dissidents and radicals, the newly minted Itter prison also housed several prominent French detainees, many of the leaders in the French Resistance, considered to be of high strategic value to the Nazis as bargaining chips. These high-profile prisoners included tennis star Jean Barotta, two former prime ministers, three former commanders-in-chief, and Marie-Agnès Caillot, the sister of French resistance leader Charles de Gaulle. The prisoners themselves represented several different interests in political ideologies. They tended to separate into three groups for meals to keep from fighting. As far as quality of life, the prisoners held at Itter Castle had it much better than other Nazi-controlled prisons and camps. They were given serviceable meals, exercise time in an open courtyard, and access to the prison library. Many of the Wehrmacht guards also regarded them differently than other Nazi prisoners, a difference which became remarkably more pronounced as the war tilted in favor of the Allies. Turning Tides Meanwhile, it turned out that the commander of Dachau camp at the time, Eduard Weiter, had fled before the camp's ultimate liberation and arrived at Itter Castle on May 2, 1945. He died that night under mysterious circumstances, though according to Paul Renault, a former French prime minister being held prisoner at Itter, Weiter had spent the night drunkenly bragging about the atrocities he had committed at Dachau before ultimately shooting and killing himself. The next day, on May 3rd, the French prisoners received word via a hidden radio that American troops were pushing into the Tyrol area, specifically the town of Innsbruck. The former political leaders among them decided that their best option would be to try and contact the Americans. That afternoon, Zvonimir Kukovic departed the castle on a bicycle with the secret mission of securing American aid. By nightfall, morale among the castle's guard staff had eroded. Following both Edward Viter's mysterious death the night prior and Kukovic's failure to return from his errand, Wemmer gave up and fled his command post, fearing for his own life. The SS guards that remained there soon followed suit, leaving the prisoners to take control of the castle, arming themselves with makeshift weapons found throughout the castle grounds. 
They did not dare leave the castle, however, because they weren't sure of the situation in the surrounding area, or how much of Tyrol was still actively under Nazi control. Instead, they hung a French flag from the castle's exterior to signal to Allied air forces who was inside and avoid attacks. Another plea for help. Because Kakovic had not yet returned, and they could not be sure if the word had gotten to the Americans, the prisoners sent another carrier out the next day, May 4th. This time, they chose their Czech cook, a man named Andreas Krobot, to ride to Virgil on a bicycle belonging to the guards with another note from inside the prison. Virgil had recently been liberated from Wehrmacht control when the majority of its discouraged Wehrmacht forces abandoned their posts, though roaming packs of SS soldiers still patrolled the area and would open fire on any house flying Austrian flags. Krobot succeeded in locating the Austrian resistance forces in the town without detection from the SS and was taken to their commander, Major Josef Gengel. Gengel was an officer in the Wehrmacht who had, like many, become disillusioned with his position. The rash actions of lingering SS troops in Virgil towards the local civilians had been the last straw, and he had officially broken his ties to the German army. In addition, he reached out to the local resistance and offered to rearm them with Wehrmacht supplies and weaponry, an act of treason that would be punishable by death. He was made the head of the resistance group in Virgil due to his experience and leadership. By the time he met with Krobot, Gengel already knew of the situation at the castle. When Krobot informed him that Wimmer and the remaining guards had abandoned the prison, Gengel was emboldened and began considering a rescue mission himself. But he could not leave the town of Virgil and its civilians unguarded, and he worried that once he reached the castle, he would not be able to hold it or protect its prisoners from an SS assault. Instead, Gengel decided to make a plea to the Americans. He had received word that American forces had reached the town of Kufstein, eight miles to the north. Gengel drove to the town, revealing a white flag of surrender when he was close enough to be seen by the American forces. In Kufstein, Gengel met with 27-year-old Captain Lee, commander of the 23rd Tank Battalion, 12th Armored Division. Lee and his troops had hoped that taking Kufstein would be their last battle, as they knew the war was winding down, and they planned to wait there until they could be relieved by the 36th Infantry Division. When Gengel sat down with Captain Lee and explained the situation at the castle, Lee quickly volunteered to spearhead a rescue mission, quickly radioing to receive permission from his commanders. A Rescue Mission Lee knew that he didn't have enough vehicles to safely escort all of the prisoners out of the castle and carry them back to Kufstein, so he planned instead to help the prisoners hold the castle from SS attacks until American reinforcements from the 142nd Battalion could search the area and snuff out the SS threat altogether. Lee and Gengel drove to the castle together in Gengel's military vehicle. They were followed by reinforcements from Lee's tank division. However, they were forced to turn back at a bridge that appeared too weak to support their weight. Fourteen American soldiers from Lee's division, a driver, and a truck with ten former Wehrmacht riflemen pressed onward towards the castle. Four miles from the castle gates, the small company encountered a party of roaming SS troops attempting to set up a barrier to block the road to the castle. A firefight ensued, and the company led by Lee and Gengel quickly persevered. Back behind castle walls, the lingering prisoners had also enlisted help from strange bedfellows. They had asked Kurt Siegfried Schrade, an SS officer stationed at the prison, whom they had come to know and trust as a defector from the Nazi cause, to head the castle's meager defense forces, sensing that an SS attack was coming. Lee and Gengel arrived at the castle and assessed the situation, finding a strange company of German defectors, French political prisoners, and Austrian resistance members all on the same side with Schrader, a man in an SS officer's uniform. The friendly German troops within the castle were asked to wear strips of black cloth around their arms so that they would be distinguishable from the hostile Germans. The SS Assault The SS troops arrived, but did not immediately launch any sort of full-scale attack. Instead, they circled the castle's perimeter, seemingly probing for a weak spot. The Germans who had sided with the prisoners inside risked being killed for treason if they were defeated by the SS, and one of the resistance Germans indeed fled in a panic from within the castle over its walls and into the surrounding forest where the SS had set up several strongpoints. This incident caused Lee to worry about the reliability of the remaining German soldiers, but Gengel convinced him to let them keep their weapons. Lee and Gengel joined Schrader in the top level of the keep, where the three leaders could see over a hundred SS troops swarming in the surrounding woods and setting up heavy ammunition guns aimed at the castle. Using a telephone in the castle, Gengel was able to reach Aloy Mayer, his fellow resistance leader in Virgil, to warn of the heavy SS presence around the castle and to request additional reinforcements. 
two more German defector soldiers and a young Austrian resistance member, Hans Waltel, were rapidly transported from the town to the castle to aid in the standoff. The Battle At ten that morning, the fighting began in earnest. Lee's own personal tank, which he had nicknamed Besatten Jenny, was positioned defensively in front of the castle's main gate. It began taking heavy rounds from a German SS gun. The three men assigned to it, including the technician inside attempting to fix its radio, managed to survive the attack and withdraw into the castle. It quickly became a question of how long the ragtag resistance unit could hold on before running out of munitions. Luckily, they had the castle's construction on their side. If the SS troops managed to scale or destroy the fortress's exterior walls, they could withdraw to its central armored keep and continue to fire from strategic positions within. The women and children among the prisoners were safely sheltered in the castle's cellar, but several of the men among them remained above ground in the courtyard to protect the basement from any oncoming attackers. Captain Lee, aware that he had not been able to give the 142nd Division a full picture of the enemy forces they would face, wanted to get word to the approaching reinforcements as quickly as possible so they would not be ambushed outside the castle gates. Because his tank radio was down and all other communication methods had been severed, French prisoner Jean Barotra, the famous tennis star of the 1920s and 30s, volunteered to deliver the message in person using his stealth and athleticism. Barotra vaulted the castle walls and ran full steam through an obstacle course of SS footholds throughout the forest to reach the 142nd and give them a full debrief of the situation up at the castle. He then requested an American Army uniform and joined the marching troops back up through the forest toward the castle. The long-awaited relief force arrived at the castle at four in the afternoon, and with their help, the remaining SS forces were quickly extinguished. Over a hundred loyal SS soldiers were taken alive as prisoners of war. The French prisoners inside the castle were evacuated that evening, arriving back in Paris on May 10th. The strange, tangled-up battle for Castle Itter was over. Two days later, Germany signed its unconditional surrender, bringing the European theater of the war to a close. Though an accurate death count is not known for the battle, it is understood that several Wehrmacht defectors were injured or killed by SS fire in the process of aiding or assisting the Nazi resistance. Gengel himself died during the battle from a sniper's bullet sustained while attempting to shield French Prime Minister Renault when pulling him out of harm's way. He was honored as an Austrian national hero, and a street in Virgil was named after him. Mm -hmm.